Well, let's look at Abel just a minute. Now, you may or may not know this, but uh, the word Abel, that name was on the lips of our master when he walked the earth. Turn to, uh, well, there are two passages, uh, Matthew 23 and Luke 11. I think I'd rather look at Luke 11. Look at Luke chapter 11. They're the same incident in the scriptures, but Luke says a little bit, says it a little bit differently. What about Abel? Abel in Luke 11:51. There's a great little testimony and teaching here. Uh, Luke 11, 50, let's look at 50. Jesus Christ is giving uh, one of his, well, the great sermon on the woes, woe unto you who ignore me. And he is rebuking the uh, people and the Pharisees. And in verse 50 he says, Therefore this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been shed since the beginning of the world. Good night. Does that mean that you and I are accountable for what has happened in the past? Well, absolutely. One of the things wrong with America today is we believe there is no past. They are expunging from history books in our public school in America the history of Christianity, the testimony of faith, the beliefs of our founding fathers, and the great religious heritage that has made our country what it is because they said that is biased and they're eliminating it. It was Woodrow Wilson I love. A people, how do you put that? A nation will not know what it ought to be unless it knows what it has been. Boy, that's great thinking there. Thank God for Woodrow Wilson. He was a great man. His father, incidentally, was a pastor, preacher. Woodrow Wilson had a really deep uh, spiritual faith. And uh, we are responsible for the past. What it said and what happened. The Lord Jesus said, you're accountable today. For the blood of all the prophets that have been shed the last how many years? 2,000? No, it had to go back beyond that because right from the lips of our Lord, verse 5, well, excuse me, verse 51, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who was killed between the altar of the sanctuary, another story we'll have to just put on the shelf. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it. You and I are responsible for how we respond to the blood of Abel. Uh, they were then, we are too. We ought to take it seriously. Well, there's something else. He, Lord Jesus uh, called him a righteous man over in uh, Matthew 23. Jesus commented about Abel. You say, well, pastor, how on earth can we take the New Testament and say it's accurate about the old? Very simple. It has the same author. God used men to write the Bible, but his Holy Spirit led them in what they should write. That's why we believe, I believe every evangelical Christian, I certainly believe it, and I see more evidence toward it than against it, and said the evidence is overwhelming that when I hold this book up and look at it, this is what God wants me to know. From Genesis to, like one old brother said, to the maps. <laughs> but really from Genesis to Revelation, this is what God said. The Holy Spirit is the author. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, divinity in human form, called Abel righteous and spoke his name from his lips on the earth. I find that tremendously definitive and authoritative. We see also about Abel in the Hebrews 11:4. 4. Turn over there again. We read on Cain in that verse 2, and uh, Hebrews 11:4. 4. But it says, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. Now, we're going to go back to that in, in just a moment. But it was a better sacrifice because it was God's kind of sacrifice. And uh, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. And Abel, the shortest life ever lived, probably in the, in, at least in the olden days. Man, he had hundreds of years ahead of him. But cut off, bang, in his youth, just like our Lord. The first man to offer blood, eliminated. The second great man to offer blood, Christ eliminated. Oh, what a picture that is. But do we remember Abel? Do we remember the Lord Jesus? Hallelujah, yes, forever. Because there are men who had a more excellent sacrifice. Their offerings toward the Father were not weak. They were strong. And gentlemen, I'd like to ask us tonight. I ask myself. I'll get on my knees and pray about this tonight. I promise you before I go to bed. Lord, help me. 
close my ears to the deafening din and lies of my generation. Turn my eyes from looking at vanity and give me life in thy ways. Well, I'm quoting the Psalm, Psalm 119, 37, 38, 39. Incline my heart to thy testimonies and not to gain. Confirm to thy servant thy promise, which is for them who love thee. Let my life be significant in the costliness of what I offer toward you so that even if I'm dead, my life will still speak. And that ought to be the prayer of any Christian that has a lick of sense at all. Abel is also mentioned in uh, uh, 1113 of Hebrews. Look at that. Verse 13. Hebrews 11, 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. Now, all these people includes this whole list in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, we call the Christian Hall of Fame. They have the Sports Hall of Fame. I see we're having the Arkansas Hall of Fame. We have the Baseball Hall of Fame. We have the NFL Hall of Fame. Well, God has his Hall of Fame. And Hebrews 11 is what that's all about. And here, verse 13 says, all these people, it talks about uh, Abel, they did not receive the things promised. All Abel did, bless his heart, was do what God told him to do, and he got killed for it. He didn't receive what was promised. He wanted to have a wife and children. Maybe he did. We don't know about that. You say, where did Cain get his wife? Oh, that's no problem. Good night, Cain and Abel and Seth, you know, if Abel had children, we don't know what for sure, but he probably did. If he didn't, Seth came along. Don't worry. God will handle it. And uh, the bloodline there was so pure they could intermarry without any problem whatsoever. It's a very simple answer. Um, the bloodline is so weak today, intermarriage will create all kinds of genetic problems. But when you were as pure as they were, it created no problem at all. Well, anyway, another great story that I would love to, to dwell on. And anyway, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of that country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abel, uh, Abel looked ahead. He saw far off what God was doing. God blessed the people who were able to see afar off. You know what's wrong with our generation today? There is no such thing as deferred gratification. We want it all now. Why should I wait? Charge it. Why should I wait? Do it. Why should I wait? Get rid of him. Why should I wait? Buy it. I tell you, the man or the woman who's able to see afar off and guide his life and mold his life and live his life, and teenagers, I pray for you especially in that area. Man, if you could have a vision when you're young to plant your life on what God has said will be rather than plant yourself on what people say today what isn't, isn't you will be far better off. What a man Abel was. Man, he knew life wasn't perfect. Adam and Eve had blown it. He had blown it. Cain had blown it. He said, boy, I have to look at what God's going to give me. If this is the way I do it through blood sacrifice, then I am going to do it. And then 12, uh, 24, look at that in Hebrews. It speaks of Abel again. 12, 24. Beautiful uh, insight uh, into his life. Ah. Uh, well... Let's look at 22. You have come to Mount Zion. Now, Zion, Mount Zion is a name for a little mountain there where Jerusalem is. To the heavenly Jerusalem, God's throne will be on earth during the millennial reign of Christ. 
And the writer of Hebrews is saying, that's what you have to look forward to. God has picked that little mountain on earth to set up his new city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You talk about a church service <laughs> that won in. Everyone's going to be there. That's no time to stay home, work in the garden, watch TV. And incidentally, we'll get home tonight before the game's over. You've heard me say the last five minutes, all that counts anyway. I'll see why. Well, never mind. Verse 23, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, you have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Boy, think of that. Not the blood of an animal, but the blood of our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back to chapter 9 quickly. I cannot let this go. I tell you, if there's any agony in my life, friends, Pastor Brown, we had uh, here about a couple of months ago, and the same week, I had uh, someone tell me that someone felt my sermons were too shallow. And then someone told me the next day that someone had said my sermons were too deep. Remember that, Carl? We all laughed about it. Heck, I don't know what they are. I'm just trying to brag on Jesus every time I stand up here. And they help me. So that's one thing. God helped the pastor. His own sermons don't help him. But you talk about deep. You talk about wonderful. Listen, there's a fire in my bones, like it said about Jeremiah. I am so desperately in love with Jesus Christ and excited about his word and wanting to be consumed with the wonder of who he is. And I have nothing but compassion for those fools who think they can find anything on this earth other than Jesus. And I don't judge them for it. I just have compassion and say, Father, forgive me for the dead ends I've run down in my life. But, oh, I would love to have hours to share. I wonder how to do it. I guess you can. But here, you're the subjects tonight. You're the guinea pig. Let's take just a minute and go back to Hebrews chapter 9 and see if we have anything deep to say about the blood of Christ. Look at verse 11 of Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made man-made. Now, see, the word tabernacle... Uh, literally means the abiding place of God. That's what a tabernacle is. In fact, in the first chapter of John's gospel, when John says that we saw him, we saw the Son, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that very word in the Greek is tabernacle. Christ, God's Son, tabernacled in our midst. It wasn't man-made. God had made Christ and sent him for us. That is to say, not a part of this creation. Verse 12, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all. And you remember when the tabernacle was done away with and the temple was built, there was the holy place where God dwelt. And in the holy place was the ark covered with gold and the Two tablets of the Ten Commandments, the rod of Aaron was there and the manna was there. And once a year, the high priest would go in and make atonement for his sins and the sins of the people. And if his, and he was guilty of anything, he could be struck dead. That's why they put bells around the bottom of his robe. They could hear him moving around there tinkling. They tied a rope around his leg so if the bells weren't heard, they could drag him out in case God killed him because he wasn't holy. And Jesus has gone into the holy place once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctifies them, them so they are outwardly clean. Incidentally, they're looking for the ashes of the heifer. They think they're buried somewhere in Jerusalem. Read a book and heard a couple of tapes on that recently. Wouldn't it be something to discover the ark or some of these ancient things there in the area of Jerusalem? Just like they have discovered Noah's ark. You know that's true, don't you? They've found it. And, of course, a skeptical world won't believe it, but the evidence is overwhelming. I must have at least 10 books in my library on the ark. Boy, what a faith uh, builder that is to me. We might find those things. How much more then, verse 14, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Man, what a passage. 
all linked to Abel. That Christ's offering was better than Abel's. Abel was that of an animal. We have our conscience cleansed so we can escape dead acts through the blood of Christ to worship the living God. All right, back to uh, uh, Genesis 4. Did you all like that little journey? Say yes. I tell you, what a thrill the Word of God is. Now, back to Genesis, and we'll bring this little message to a conclusion. Verse 3, we've talked about Abel. We've talked about Cain. We've got commentary on them from the Old Testament. We see how the contradictions work. Now, verse 3 says, in the course of time. Now, literally in the Hebrew language, this means at the end of days. And the connection is such that it is strongly implied, no way to get around it, that the Lord God has set a specific time for an offering to be made by Abel and by Cain. In fact, we read a few minutes ago over in Hebrews chapter 11, 4, remember it? By faith, Abel offered. Faith implies a divine revelation. See, Jesus doesn't expect any of us tonight to do anything he hadn't revealed to us to do. No way you can do it. I mean, when Bert Holstein led me to Christ, he said, H, remember this, God will never give you new light until you lived up to the light you already have. There's a lot of truth in that. The Lord will not give you new light until you live up to the light you already have. A lot of us don't like that. We don't want to live up to this light. We want to kind of ignore it and get new light over here. And God says, no, sir. So you say, well, poor old Cain, he didn't know what to do. Yes, he did. Abel knew what to do. And God is a righteous, holy God. And the thrust of the Hebrew language here is so clear that God had revealed himself to Cain and to Abel, and he had told them, I want you to come with an offering recognizing your sin. Now, two quick things here, and I think I might just shut this down right now. Now, don't close your Bibles. <laughs> Cain brought the offering of the field. Now, we won't take time to look at it, but if you have a new international version of the Bible, uh, all the offerings are given on page 150 of the NIV Bible. The burn offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, and uh, one of the key ones there is the grain offering. But if you study that, you'll find that every offering to given by God, save one, was a blood sacrifice. There was one, a grain offering, or sometimes called a meal offering. And here would be a wonderful time to take all those things and look at them. And there's a great spiritual lesson for you and me tonight and every one of them, but we just don't have time to look. Oh, Lord, be patient with us. But whenever a grain offering was given, it was a fellowship offering of how the believer wanted to have perfect, wonderful union with the Father. But one of the teachings of the Leviticus offering system was, and you'll find it listed there, I believe, on page 150, it says that the grain offering can never be given alone. The fellowship offering can never be given alone because there's no way to have fellowship with God apart from the blood. There is nothing you and I can do to have fellowship with God the Father apart from the shed blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Cain came to the Father, he came in three manners. He said, I will bring an offering from the ground. In Genesis 3, God had cursed the ground. Cursed be the ground. You'll make your living of it by the toil and sweat of your brow. Now, I'm leaving out. I had that in there to read tonight, each of these. But the ground was cursed. Your efforts are cursed. You know that yourself. There are some of us here tonight who have done our best to try to be the men we need to do, be to our wives, and we have blown it. It's not in us to be everything we need to be to our wives. Right, gentlemen? Unless God helps you, you'll never be the husband you need to be. Your self-effort isn't enough. And any of us tonight who are parents can look back on things they did and with shame say, oh God, why wouldn't I better parent 
to my child. Your self-effort will not do it. And I could stop tonight and share two or three situations I know with my daughter and my son that I will repent of until the day I stand before Jesus Christ. Not bad things to you. Really not all that bad, I guess, at all, but my heart breaks because I wasn't more what I should have been than my son and my daughter. And you remember what Larry Crabb says, we'll probably spend the first 30 years in heaven repenting of our parenthood. You do not have it within you to be the husband, the wife, or the parent, even that you would die to be. Your self-effort isn't enough. Cain brought self-effort. Secondly, he also, when uh, he brought this offering, uh, had forgotten that Adam and Eve clothed themselves with skin, uh, with leaves, excuse me, with fig leaves. And they took the cursing from the ground and thought they could wrap these fig leaves around them when God came. Adam and Eve, why are you naked? They weren't worried about their physical nakedness. I think all of us recognize the most awesome nakedness is our spiritual and our psychological and our mental emptiness. We're empty people. We're shallow people. And we can't cover it with a raise or with a new title or a new house or a new dress or a new trip or a new pretense. Man, Fayetteville, Arkansas is filled with people covered with fig leaves. And we call them other things, but that's what they are. God said, Cain, you can't cover yourself with anything that this earth produces. Won't do it. And the third area where Cain blew it, he said he thought he could do it himself. See? And God rejected it. And the Lord did not have respect the Cain's offering. But he did have respect to Abel's offering. Why? Abel had been obedient to the Father. He had sacrificed the gift that God had given him. And he had the faith to trust what the Father said to do. We talk about tithing and people walk out the door. All they ever talk about is money. Wake up! Wake up! What Mickey Bonner always say when he was here, I loved it. Help! <laughs> Help! What's wrong with us? We're all filled. The church is filled with shallow sacrificers. And no wonder we're angry at the world and what God has done, or we think God has done, because he has not received our cheapness. He won't do it. Remember what David told Arana, the Jebusite? David had said, and the Lord said, go buy you a place, buy the planting, the threshing floor of Arana, which is today. Uh, the go force are here tonight, some others, the Pashas who are with me in Israel, right there where the temple was built. That was the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. And David went and said, let me buy this. And Aaron said, oh, no, my Lord, you're the king. I see you're the greatest man. Let me give it to you. And David said, no, God forbid that I offer to God that which has cost me nothing. Pastor Brown and Steve Shaw and I were talking about church models. Friends, there's all kinds of churches out there. Bible churches, Baptist churches, evangelical churches, charismatic churches, fast growth churches, you know, user-friendly churches and all that stuff. You can put it all in a box and throw it in the garbage can. I'm all for new methods. We ought to use them. But there's only one method that works, and that's sacrificial love. If we have that, anything else will work. If we don't have that, nothing will work. So to sum this up, what was Cain's problem? Why was he angry? Why could he not live life at peace? Because he wasn't right with his God. And he wasn't right with God because his worship was cheap. What a man is always begins with his worship of the Heavenly Father. And it must be costly. 
And so I leave it there tonight. Not that I'm finished with it, but hopefully that perhaps I've said enough. And perhaps this little flock here tonight, there are enough of us to see. And Lord, I live in a world of unclean lips. I live in a world of lies and pretense. I live in a world of fig leaves. And I live in a world that pursues the earth. But my God, I shall offer thee the blood of Christ. I shall come in sacrificial reverence and praise and gratitude for what you have done for me on the cross and spend the rest of my life in sacrificial service to the pursuit of what you have told me to do in your word. Only those who do that are not cheated. Everyone else plays the food.